painting should be a way of extending your own truth, your own visual truth, the way you see the world, interpret the world, and the way you portray it onto canvas. That is what I believe is painting your own truth. And here's an image of our model, Jen, and there's gonna be a picture of her to the top left corner of your screen throughout all of the painting footage, so you can feel free to follow along with me. So this video is going to be in the old school style of how I used to create these paintings, uh, mainly just because of some uh, audio uh, difficulties. I can't really get into that right now, but uh, for the demonstration, this is going to be voiceover style, and with this episode, I'm going to be doing a painting painting, as I call them. So I have painting demonstrations and then painting paintings. So for me, a painting painting is my visual truth, and that is what the uh, topic of this uh, painting video or uh, tutorial, however you want to call it, is going to be about. It's going to be about painting your own truth. And now we're going to label that as a subtopic to the main topic, which is guiding you through this painting demonstration. So first, since we're in voiceover style and it's a little bit laid back, I'll list out the colors for you so you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, deter yourself from watching to go down to the description box. So I have titanium white, flake white, burnt umber, alizarin, permanent, cadmium red, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, Nickel yellow, cadmium green, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. And of course, if you want to know exactly what colors I'm using and or purchase the same type of materials and therefore contributing a little bit to this channel, I have as Amazon affiliate links in the description box down below. And for the photo reference, if you would like to download this photo reference, I will leave a link all the way at the bottom of the description box to the Facebook photo reference group where you can scroll through and look at some of the previous photo references that I posted along with this exact photo reference if you would like to paint along with me. Now, as you can see, we have established the composition. And remember, the composition is the first thing that I look for in pretty much all of the you know, various different painting demonstrations that you've seen. And it's the first step even in my own studio work. So today's episode is going to be uh, very much close to my own studio work, how I actually paint. But this is going to be a much more abbreviated video because for me to demonstrate for you exactly how I paint actually takes uh, several weeks because it does take me a much longer period of time to create what I call a painting painting. And so what we're doing here is just now starting to transition into the block-in stage. So we moved from the compositional stage, which was about placing all of the elements in space uh, as correctly as we possibly can, to what is now the block-in stage, where we just use a simple set of straight lines and angles to simplify all of the complex forms that we are looking at when we are observing the model from nature. So I'm going to have, like I said, the main topic and then the subtopic. So the subtopic, again, is painting your own truth. So let's go back and forth between the main topic and the subtopic. Otherwise, it's just going to be uh, the same old, same old me guiding you through a painting. So for the subtopic, painting your own truth, it what it means is to be truthful to yourself. Okay. And now... This is going to be kind of difficult for me to explain, but for my painting demonstrations, I know it's very hard for a lot of folks on the internet to understand, but most of those painting demonstrations where I was talking and painting at the same time were demonstrations. They're not how I actually paint. They're not how I produce painting paintings. Now, in the past, uh, the videos that I used to upload in this exact style uh, the voiceover style, such as the classical approach painting, um, you know, the Alla Prima paintings and all of the ones in this style, those were much closer to how I create painting paintings, okay? So how you create your own painting paintings 
is pretty much up to you and it's how you react to the, a given situation and it's how you interpret what you're looking at in nature and now back to the main topic so now we have worked our way f- uh, we're still in the blocking stage okay so we worked our way from the outside shapes now we're working into the inside shapes. So I usually go in with a center line and start to place things in. Uh, but lately, I kind of just go right for the uh, eye sockets. So don't be confused with eyebrows. Though I am you know, trying to put in the contour for the eyebrows, I'm very much looking for the top most structure for the eye sockets to place in the large shapes of the eyes. And the brush that I'm using right here is just a clean and dry bristle brush. And I'm using this as my eraser brush to push the paint a little bit um, higher up. Basically, just treating it like you would a kneaded eraser if you were working with charcoal. Now I'm starting to sketch out the shadow shape for the concavity of the eye socket to the right of your screen. Now I'm going to look for the corner of the side of the, um, the eye. Now this is the umber sketch okay so let's talk let's talk a little bit about the difference between uh painting painting for me and a painting demonstration so, uh, there i am looking for the angle of the eye so right now let's talk about the subtopic okay um so for me in a demonstration i will go much faster and i will lean less t- less towards realism and more towards just trying to make it uh, you know, easy for folks to understand. Therefore, the drawing in my uh, regular demonstrations that you've seen where I actually paint and talk, the drawing is almost never as accurate as in my painting paintings. Now, in my painting paintings, as you may have seen uh, a couple episodes ago, I uploaded a video that I titled The Movie, where you saw that I erased the block in that I had a couple times, though I think I only showed once, but um, yes, I do that. I draw the face, okay, the block in, and then I erase it, okay? So you may be wondering, well, why would you draw something in and then erase it? Just because I go over and over and over the same lines in the block in stage until I feel like they are as correct as I can make them. Now, correct is not necessarily mean exactly like the photo reference okay so don't get it confused because when i paint from life okay i'm not trying to copy uh, what i'm looking at with the model rather i'm trying to uh, reason with the shapes and see if the shapes make visual sense to me and as a result from that more careful approach as you see i'm much more cautious with the lines in the footage that you're seeing here as a result Uh, The accuracy is much stronger in my studio work, in my painting paintings, okay? Now let's go back into the main topic, okay? So right now we are looking for the main triangle. So the main triangle consists of the two eyes and the nose. Think of each of those features as a dot, a dot for one eye, a dot for the other eye, and then a dot for the nose. Now, of course, I didn't draw dots, but... I think of it in that kind of way. I simplify that that, uh, geometry in my head. So I think about it as just a simple triangle. Now, I prioritize the eyes and the nose because on a technical level, just to be practical, the eyes are much more difficult to move than the nose. And the nose is more difficult to move than the mouth. That's why you don't really see the mouth in here yet. And it's much more difficult to move Uh, than, say, the hairline or the chin, okay? And this is just to be practical, okay? That's the idea. If you can get the eyes and the nose, in particular the eye sockets, and the bottom of the nose in the relative correct location, you're in a pretty good position to build all of the larger structures surrounding the eyes and the nose, which is kind of like the headquarters. Now, That mark I just made for the corner of the nose uh, is a pretty good indicator of the furthest distance to the left that the nose will go. This one right here is for the furthest distance that the uh, extremity to the right of the nose will go. So I compare the corner of the tear duct of one eye to the corner of the nose on one side. So I compare those 
points to one another. Now, since this is voiceover style and we are already just passing the 10 minute mark in the episode, I will give some moments of silence just so I don't fill up the video with too much talk. All right, so I'm back now. See how I'm using that vertical line? So I'm comparing now the mouth, that little point for the mouth, to the corner of the tear duct of the eye. And I even compare it uh, to the corner of the nose, okay? So remember that a line is just a pathway between two points. As one of my favorite teachers, John DeMartin, would say, a line is a pathway between two points. There I am checking the angles between all of the features. And mind you, at this stage, I had the face a little bit elongated. Okay, so this is just the first try at trying to draw the face in with the block in. Okay, now uh, if this were a demonstration as opposed to a uh, painting painting, which is what we're doing here, then I would have just went with it and went right into the large planes of colors, and then try to correct it from there. But at this point, I didn't realize it in the painting, uh, but I did have the face a little bit elongated. The eyes were too close to one another. The face was not the correct shape. The model's face is less of a pill-like shape and more of a heart-like shape. So that's kind of how I um, think about those shapes. So. Uh, I think in about a couple minutes or something, you're gonna see a transition where I have already erased this part of the block in and used the ghost to draw over top of more accurately. And the ghost is pretty much what is left when I take a dry bristle brush and just kind of uh, scratch off the lines of the block in. Very similar to what you could do if you were doing a graphite drawing and you just rolled a little bit of kneaded eraser over it. And there you see I am drawing in the um, shadow shape, okay, so the boundary between light and shadow, the terminator line, um, that's what I'm starting to draw in with the shadow shape. And by the way, the drawing color is burnt umber. I think I forgot to mention this before. I'm using just burnt umber to draw with. Why? Because burnt umber, I feel like it's a little less intrusive um, than say if I were drawing with the dioxazine purple or alizarin or something like that. It's, ju it's just less intrusive. You could use uh, burnt sienna if you wanted to to do your under drawings. Uh, you could use raw umber if you'd like. You can even use Van Dyke brown um, if you want to use a drawing color that's less intrusive to the um, you know, the flesh tones and whatever colors that you'll be layering onto your painting afterwards, okay? Now I'm gonna give another little moment of silence. Okay, and now to break the silence. Um, now you see the ghost, okay? Specifically with the nose, specifically, sorry, with the nose, okay? You see that I'm drawing with a thin, paintbrush, okay, this is a, pretty much a size zero synthetic round brush, okay, very meticulously now I'm mapping out a much more specific shape for the shadow of the corner of the nostril, okay, the nostrils themselves, there I just drew in the nostril to the right of your screen, and the idea is just to have it simplified into a few simple sets of lines. Now again, this is what differentiates my painting paintings from my demonstrations, okay? The demonstrations where you see me actually painting and talking to you will never be as accurate as the paintings that you'll see um, edited in this way where I'm not actually painting and talking because at this point, my focus is about 95% on the painting. And I say 95 because if my focus was 100% on the painting, I'd have a camera crew dealing with all of the filming stuff for me. And now then, back to the main topic, okay? Um, 
just using a little piece of uh, paper towel. I think that I ran out of Vivo. That's, uh, I think, Bounty. <laughs> you know the theme song, Bounty, Quicker, Picker, Upper. Anyway, yep, that's a Bounty paper towel that I just rolled up to use as an eraser. Um, kind of like you would with a kneaded eraser where you roll the kneaded eraser into a fine point to erase your charcoal. Now you see how I'm just using a simple line to map out the cast shadow of the nose. Um, I didn't quite like the way that this shadow looked outlined. It kind of it just aesthetically was bothering me. And like I was saying, um, with the subtopic of this video, this video paint, painting your truth, paint how you feel it should look. Okay, be truthful to yourself. And I just didn't like the way it looked with the outline. So that's why I'm going in with with a separate brush and just kind of uh, sketching in the uh, simple shadow shape. And there I go with the bounty quicker picker upper and just erasing a little bit on the side of the nose, okay? I'm very cautious of the center line. Even though I didn't draw the center line, at this point in the painting, I was extremely cautious about making sure that the nose was oriented in the relative correct position. And the, one of the difficulties with um, portrait painting, in particular, trying to explain it and demonstrate it, some of you may know if you are art teachers or teach portrait painting classes or things like that, is that there's a lot of complex stuff involved in describing uh, the process. And then add to that, the fact that it gets really repetitive. See how, you know, I'm going right back into the corners of the mouth and trying to make it much more specific. Now, the repetitiveness, if that's even a word, um, the repetitive nature of uh, the painting demonstration is not really the most suitable for every audience, okay? So that's why, um, you know, these videos are edited in such a way. This painting, in fact, uh, took me pretty much an entire studio day. Uh, so around six and a half hours, I believe, uh, is what it took me to create this uh, final piece. And oh, by the way, this painting, I will be, uh, it has been posted to Etsy, okay? So this painting is for sale, okay? You're able to purchase it as a painting painting, an original Yupari painting. So there will be links to my Etsy account down below, okay? So now back to the main topic. Now that I'm drawing the mouth back in, earlier I had the mouth a little bit too far down. Uh, so the proportion was off before. And I had the mouth, the shape of the lips, a little too small. So earlier I was kind of generalizing uh, the shape of the mouth. Though the outside shape of the face still isn't quite there yet, um, the mouth itself, you know, it, it just wasn't as accurate before I wiped it out. So now, after putting in uh, these newer shapes, and now I'm starting to kind of sketch in the shadow shape, it starts to make a little bit more sense. And then from the mouth, I'll then start to move into the outside shape of the face. There you see I'm drawing with just a simple line, okay? Just a simple line, the corner of the side of the chin. All right, so now we have switched to um, bristle brushes. So just titanium white and the nickel yellow. Okay, now we're starting to throw in the yellow ochre and the flake white. And now we're throwing in a little bit of cadmium orange. And there we just threw in a little bit of the alizarin permanent and sap green. Okay, back to the yellow ochre and now the cadmium red and the sap green. Okay, so if you're new to this channel and you don't know uh, what I'm doing, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm pre-mixing the color value web. So the color value web uh, ranges from light values to middle tone values to dark values. And remember, value just means the relative lightness or darkness of a given shape of color. And that's all it means. And I just wanted to pre-mix the color value web because the way I'm going to approach the painting now is to attack it plane by plane. And this is exactly how 
I work in my own studio painting. So if you follow me on Instagram, if you're on my Patreon, uh, then you've seen how some of my uh, studio paintings look, okay? And in particular on the Instagram, you'll see, um, you know, a large painting where it's just a few simple lines, and then I just go right in and attack all of the forms for the face. Now, this is going to be part of the... Um, the subtopic, and I'm going to relate it to the main topic, meaning the painting demonstration. So now let me tell you some of my own uh, personal truth and how I create paintings and what I think about when I'm creating paintings, okay? So rather than try to cover the entire thing with color all at once and try to, you know, perfectly match shapes of color, um, as you've seen me do in some demonstrations, when I work in my own studio painting, what I actually like to do is look for the areas where the most stuff is happening, the more active areas in the painting. And I try to attack those first. I try to attack the more active areas of a painting before getting hung up on some of the less active areas, such as the background, or the neck, or the side of the neck, sorry, or the forehead, or the hair. Do you see where I'm getting at now? You might have an idea what I mean when I say active, okay? And active, let me just define it now. For me, okay, active means areas that are more difficult to paint and areas that are more eye-catching, okay? So it's it's no coincidence you see me starting to paint in the planes for the eye to the left. I could have easily started with the eye to the right, but I tend to look for the most active areas. And that's just because I think it's my own personality. I I don't have patience to just work on like a whole bunch of different shapes and then tell myself, oh, I'll come back later and make this shape look more correct or telling myself oh it's okay i'll come back and fix it later i actually prefer to just go in and attack i go in right for the color that i want and the value that i want okay now to relate this to um, the classical approach okay the classical approach gives out the same information to the viewer as this approach that I'm using here. This is, in fact, a combination of the alla prima approach and the classical approach, okay? Now, switching that back into the main topic, okay? So hopefully you're still with me. Now, the main topic, okay, to get back to the demonstration, what I have done is I started with a value, okay? A plane, sorry. And now I'm looking at each plane surrounding the eye socket okay and i'm relating each shape of color to one another and i'm thinking about the structure of the forms that i'm painting onto and at the same time i'm asking myself how does the form on the model that i'm observing deviate from a more generic head or more generic eye okay i know what a generic eye looks like in my head, all right? What I wanna make sure is to look for the shape of the eye socket, the shape of the eye itself, the upper eyelid, the lower eyelid. And what I noticed with this model is that her eyes are a little bit, uh, it's kind of hard to explain visual things verbally, but uh, wider. Her eyes are more wide set then they are almond. Her eyes are not kind of generic almond. They're more wide set with a pretty clear and sharp uh, division near the top corner of the eye socket, okay? So I try to observe these subtle differences. And even with the model's glabella, okay? Her glabella, um, so the area in between the two eye sockets is wider than on a generic model, okay? And this is how you can achieve more of a likeness by comparing, um, you know, the model that you're looking at to a more generic uh, conceptualization of a model. 
And so at this point in the painting, what you're seeing me do here is I'm just uh, rounding out the uh, values for the sclera. The sclera is the white of the eye. And remember that the white of the eye is not white, though at this stage in the painting, I had the sclera a little bit too light. So I eventually go back in and fix that later. Um, but what I'm trying to do here is just curve the values surrounding the sclera. The eyeball is round, okay? So the values get darker as it turns away from the light. And like I said, I'm attacking the painting at this point, okay? Plane by plane. You don't always have to work like this. Sometimes in my own studio work, I will actually go in with uh, larger brushes than this and look at, uh, you know, different planes. But uh, for the sake of this demonstration, I wanted to get to the point much faster because I knew at this point I only had one day to paint this. I only had one day to paint this and then only one day to edit it and voice it over before it was due to be uploaded. So had I more time, I may have actually approached this with uh, larger brushes, larger bristle brushes, and looked at you know larger planes as opposed to going into the smaller planes. But in any case, now you see it's starting to get repetitive, right? So now I'm going into uh, the same exact shapes that I put in before, but now I'm starting to gauge those values and make them more specific. Now I'm going to give another little moment of silence. All right, and I'm back from the moment of silence. So now what I'm doing is I'm actually pushing the chroma a little bit and the shadow for the concavity of the eye socket. So the shadow up here is a much uh, warmer in comparison to the um, darker values surrounding the face, in particular, uh, the lower eyelid. And it's warmer most likely because all the forms, uh, all the flesh tones around the face are reflecting and making it appear um, a little bit warmer just by comparison. Now I painted in the other eye, so the eye to the right. And again, it would have been repetitive to show and explain the same thing at once, uh, all at once again. So that's why that uh, I edited that. But anyway, now we're looking for the front plane of the uh, the bulb of the nose, okay? And what I'm looking for is just a simple flat shape of color. And what I'm trying to do is go for the brightest values and utilize the tone of the canvas as much as I can. The tone of the canvas was achieved by just uh, diluting a little bit of burnt umber uh, with odorless mineral spirits, and then just uh, using a microfiber cloth to tone the canvas and letting it dry overnight, or in this case, it was already dry, um, I think a couple weeks prior to filming this. But in any case, now what we're starting to do with a smaller brush now is to work our way towards the side of the bulb of the nose, okay? And just like we did with the eye, okay, we place in one plane, okay, start with a plane, any plane, start to relate the plane surrounding that main plane, and then continue to build. And there's a lot of, excuse me, there's a lot of reasoning involved with these shapes. It's more than just um, trying to copy down what you're looking at. And again, like I always say, and I always have to uh, repeat myself with each video, the objective is to look at and interpret visual information, okay? It is not about copying a photograph. I am not a human photocopier, and neither are you. So that's why I will always emphasize that this is not about copying. Um, 
don't worry about what other people may say. There are some people on the internet or just in general who are sick in the fact that they take pleasure in trying to bring other people down. And that is just emotionally cannibalistic behavior. So if any people on the internet or in person give you trouble for unfinished paintings or things like that, in particular with portrait, just ignore them. They are emotionally cannibalistic. They're just trying to make themselves feel better by making others feel down. And what you do is you just don't let those people or the, those critics or those cynics bring you down in any manner. And I'm telling you this because your own artwork, your own work that you create is your visual truth. You're painting your own truth. And don't worry about what the cynics or the emotionally cannibalistic people uh, may say or may think of you, okay? It is your own artwork and don't let anyone else try to tell you or deter you otherwise. Now, transitioning from the subtopic back to the main topic, uh, what you're seeing there I'm going to have to explain since you didn't see the mixture on the palette, hence the close-up. But anyway, um, with the nostril, I tend to use my alizarin permanent color. Why? Because it is a reddish dark color that's a really good tinter. So I wanted the dark of the nose, though it doesn't really pick up too well on the camera, to be a little bit warmer in nature just because... Um, when you're working from life, there's much more warm tones, depending on the lighting, of course, uh, with the nose, okay? And in particular, the accent uh, for the nostril of the nose. And now we're going in with the side plane of the nose. And that was just kind of a yellow ochre-ish type of color. And now I just threw in a little bit of cadmium red. And now I'm creating what I call a rail. So a rail is just a color that I kind of paint right next to the color value web so that it automatically has a transition of value. Now you see that I have a transition of kind of a pinkish color, okay? So starting with a plane, okay? Pick a plane, any plane. So I chose the front plane of the upper lip. The color is cadmium red influenced by some of the middle tones of the color value web and what that influence of the middle tone does for the reds for the lips is to ensure that the lips are not a generic reddish pink color but that in fact they have a little bit of nuance to them the flesh tones for the lips uh, so that they're not you know just a generic pink and now relating to the main topic okay we're just looking at the simple divisions between um light shapes and dark shapes and right there what I'm actually doing is I'm sharpening the edge uh, for the middle uh, the top middle portion of the upper lip so edge wise with the lips I tend to sharpen um, closer towards the middle soften towards the corners of the lips and then sharpen again in the accent uh, the corners of the accents of the side of the lips okay that's kind of how i treat the edge work uh, relating to the lips if the edge quality for the lips was the same all throughout the lips it would look kind of a little bit two-dimensional almost painted on now uh, what i'm looking for at this point is a dark accent okay there it is the dark shadow excuse me that was the shadow that i painted right over top of the accent for the corner of the lip okay nothing too terribly difficult there just using the uh, that rail that warm color rail that i painted on the side of the lips though that has a little bit of influence uh, from the alizarin permanent but in any case um, just trying to push those colors now i usually work the larger structures around the mouth or the lips sorry before getting right into the lips usually but that's not always the case. Obviously, it wasn't the case for this one. So for this one, I just saw it to be better to just go right into the shapes of the lips. Uh, just because the lips are a little bit more prominent 
in um, in this model, and it's kind of prominent to um, her likeness. So I thought it was a better idea to go right into the lips. And like I was saying with the subtopic, uh, painting your truth, your own truth, okay? Other people uh, may start off, you know, like, like someone like me may start off with the shapes surrounding the mouth and then going back into the mouth. And not always the case. It doesn't always have to be that way, okay? Um, it's important to be adaptable for, uh, you know, as many different situations as possible. And now to uh, put in some more dark shapes. So I used a little bit of Neo McGilp, as I recall, and that... Um, Part so a little bit of Neo McGilt medium, and again, links in the description uh, for the exact materials. Now, what I'm doing is I'm softening the corner for the hairline, and I decided to show this clip in particular just because the hairline, this edge right here, is so important. Uh, it's it's so important to get this edge to be really really soft, and the way I approach it is to soften and push this edge up actually. So soften or soften however you want to say i'm pushing the edge up a little bit okay so just making the edge soft as i move it up towards the hair and then i'm going to kind of mesh it into the hairline just trying to have a very very soft touch to that edge it's one of the most important edges to pay attention to if it is too sharp if it's left too sharp it may look like, um, you know, your model has a wig on or something like that, which this model uh, clearly does not. And now you'll see how I kind of blend it into that shape, okay? And there's going to be much more um, stuff off camera here just so I can get to the point much faster and show you what I was doing and how, how I was doing it and why. Now you see that the dark shape for the hair has now been filled in and now the next step to do is to uh, you know assess the background as you see all of the planes surrounding the face have already been painted in as i was already explaining to you i was looking for each of the shapes uh, plane by plane and relating them to one another now what i'm doing is i'm mixing up a little bit of the sap green the ivory black there is a little bit of odorless mineral spirits and Neo McGilt medium on this brush. And like I was saying, this is exactly how, except in a much faster uh, rate of time, I work on my painting paintings, okay? So in my painting paintings, I don't usually like it to be just a floating head. So now I'm going to actually put in some of the values that you are seeing in the background. Now I'm not gonna show you all of the footage for painting in the background, just because that, again, the word is repetitive. I don't wanna show too much repetitive stuff. And speaking of repetitive, now it's time to give another little moment of silence. And then uh, now that we're painting in the background, just to further clarify uh, the difference between painting demonstration and actual painting, I'm going to insert in two of my paintings of the same model, okay? And now you're seeing this painting to the left, which was a YouTube demonstration, okay? Abbreviated a demonstration. And the painting to the right is a painting painting, a studio painting, and it's a cropped uh, image okay so those were two images showing the difference between painting painting and demonstration painting the main difference being that my painting paintings my truth okay is my truth in painting is that i do the best that i can to get a more naturalistic look a more look you know reflecting what it's actually like to observe a human being or to observe, um, uh, you know, whatever subject that you're painting. Now you're seeing, uh, I'm inserting in the, uh, the next compositional element in this painting, which is the little drapery on the back. So the green drapery. And I just liked it. I like the way that the, um, that kind of sweeping motion from the drapery, uh, 
you know, if you follow the line through from where my brush is all the way down towards the hair, it's just kind of one uniform abstract shape, okay? So that was one compositional thing that I liked. And as you notice, I'm not painting it, painting it at all uh, like what the photograph looks like. So I'm kind of taking bits and pieces of the, um, the thing that I'm observing from the photo reference and uh, creating my own interpretation of it. I'm choosing to make the drapery less realistic than the, um, than the face and less realistic even than the hair, uh, just so that it kind of creates some contrast in the, the painting. And I'm pushing the chroma in the drapery a little bit. So I'm making it much more saturated. I'm make, making it much more bright than the uh, photo reference shows it. In fact, the colors in the photo reference are a little bit too flat in my opinion. So, you know, take it that as you will. Um, photographs will distort perspective and color, among other things, but they're still extremely useful to, you know, use for paintings. Obviously, I use photo references, you know, out of necessity uh, for these paintings. But there you see very quickly, very swiftly, uh, the shapes for the drapery have been painted in. Now at this point, things will start to get repetitive. So again, there will be some some edits so you can see. And just like I mentioned before, uh, I look for the areas where the most stuff is happening, the most active areas. So at this point in the painting, I had already painted in pretty much all of the most active areas. So that's why here you see me in the end starting to put in these more subtle details, obviously not following exactly what the photo reference had. And we're gonna finish this up with the ear. That's the corner of the dark accent for the tragus of the ear, okay? So just looking for a few simple shapes uh, to, you know, demonstrate the uh, the planes on the ear. And I'm going to, in general, just keep the ear a little bit less realistic. So, again, this is pretty much the last thing I was looking for. Uh, just because the ear, I just wanted it to be kind of, uh, you know, faded towards the back. I don't want to draw the viewer's attention towards the ear. And... Again, the finish of this painting is designed so that this painting can be exhibited. It can be in uh, exhibitions, you know, with my name signed on it, an original oil painting of mine. So that's why, um, you know, I painted it how I preferred it to look when it's hanging in a gallery wall or something like that, okay? Or just hanging in my own studio or something like that. Wherever it's going to be hanging, I just didn't want too much emphasis to be on the ear. So there, we're just going to put in a few more little half tones, okay? So at this point, it's pretty much just going to be just a little plane to delineate the, uh, the helix and the anti-helix. So there, that half tone is just going to very, uh, you know, quickly uh, differentiate them. And again, just trying to make the edges as soft as possible and pushing the warmth in the ear. That is, I'm making the ear a little bit warmer in temperature than the uh, flesh tones surrounding the face, but uh, not saturating it too much, okay? And there we are just putting in the last few little marks for the helix and anti-helix. And now let's just throw on a signature onto this painting and call it a day. I'd like to thank you so much for watching today's episode. I truly wish you the best in all of your artwork. If you would like to support this channel even more, I have a Patreon account where you can uh, watch me paint live in real time, or you can chat with me. And of course, if you would like to purchase this painting, I will have the link in the description box down below to my Etsy store, where you can purchase this painting directly from that link. Thanks again so much for watching. I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next episode.